Cincinnati 2001, the environment was uh, very um, uh, not inclusive, um, not wanting to hear the voices of the people. In 2001, as you can recall, people were in the streets. There were a lot of community meetings being held, a lot of conversation about what will make our city better, what um, is the plight of African Americans, what is affecting and impacting African Americans in the city of Cincinnati. So in 2001, there were uh, a vast array of emotions, you know, depending on what you were doing and where you were on that day. At that time, my son was seven, I believe. My youngest son was seven. And um, in the fourth, third grade, and having to explain to him why, why his parents were so active in the community around what was happening. Um, as you recall, the restaurants had closed um, the prior year. So that actually uh, started the Cincinnati Black and Animal Front, so restaurants closing. And we didn't understand why that was happening or if it was actually a legal process that they could do, considering the 1964 um, um, law that says you just can't close when people are coming to town. Right? And so we were very concerned. But then the two and 24 hours happened um, in November. Um, and so that led us to listen to the community, hear the community's cries. Um, and then at that time it was the community and the police, the shooting of 15 unarmed black men and what what should happen, what could we do? Um, why does the Cincinnati Police Department see African American men as such a, 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 a violent threat and why is shoot to kill um, the way to go? Um, what could we what could we do to make it better? You know, when you understand the impact of oppression, Brandy, um, like I said, there were so many things that were going on in the city of Cincinnati. Um, but when you focused on one issue, as we had done in the Cincinnati Black and Under Front, as it related to policing in the black community, policing the black community, uh, what we decided to do was to branch off into five different groups throughout the city and get the messages from the community so that we would understand our direction. We could better impact what needed to happen by understanding the totality of what was happening. At the end of all of the community conversations, this is what you got. Um, and I remember that we would always take notes. We would always put them up on the wall so that people could see what everyone was saying because when you tend to tell a story, people say, oh, you're making things up. This is not what folks are saying. This is what the people were saying, and this is how people felt. And people did not feel that they had an avenue of redress or that they were able to tell their story um, or that they were able to go somewhere and say, well, this officer used excessive force. How can we change this? What should I do? And then how do I deal with my children? How do I deal with my sons or the community's sons or the, the little boy that lives down the street from me? How do I give him back his pride and his dignity so that the relationship between the black community and the Cincinnati Police Department isn't altered, uh, isn't uh, one that's seen as um, us against them, and that's where we were. Um, and of course, doing the 30-year study um, on policing in the black community that we had done was extremely significant, going back to understand where policing came from, how policing policed the black community, uh, what the black community had to go through, um, the things uh, that we had gone through, things that were never talked about, things that were covered up, things that, that no justice was put to. You have to put it in context because we often get caught with change. I remember, uh, let me tell you the story. I remember our very first um, monitoring team. It was a team that was led by a guy by the name of Kamenoff. That was his last name. I think he lasted here in the city maybe a year or so. And his team came in and all parties met over at the Union Institute. And I remember wanting this change so badly for the black community, just to have something to say that we've done this. This is something that we pushed for, we accomplished. This will be everlasting change. We can't go backwards. Our children's children's children will be able to benefit from it. 
and their team told us to not expect any significant change for 10 years. It took the air out of my, out of my wings. I was just devastated because the black community needed a win. We needed to say that we accomplished something, that we worked towards a goal, and we got there. But to hear 10 years put into it was like, wow. It, what are you telling me? <laughs> I did all this work, all the sacrificing, um, all of this back and forth, um, uh, meetings and consulting with people and getting all of this information. And it's going to take 10 years for a significant change. And guess what? They were absolutely right. We're talking about changing institutions, changing people's thoughts, changing people's minds, and then ultimately changing their actions. So while we were changing the police department, the community had to look into itself and see, where do I fit in? How do I change? How can I become the change that I want to see on the other side? And that's huge. That's, that's huge. And so we've been constantly working, um, working with youth on knowing their rights, helping them to build their knowledge of what is acceptable, what isn't acceptable, what is real, what's not real, what you should do, what you should not do, um, what the policies and procedures are so that they too can turn to their friends and tell them so they can become the agents of change that we need to see. And I think that's the change in the community is that you will see a lot of younger folk um, because they don't necessarily have the tools in their pockets to know how to deal with policing. Um, and many other situations, you know, you have to experience those and grow into it. Understand that, yes, you do have to respond with your name, but you don't have to say anything else. This is your right. That stops it right there. That stops the violation. It stops you from feeling like you're the victim when you actually are in control of your own self. What I think as something that Cincinnati should do, Cincinnati people in Cincinnati, is to clearly look at our past practices and behaviors and understand uh, that being exclusive, having the door shut, because over the last couple of years, there's been a huge fight with CPS as it related to the rebuilding of the schools, the billion dollar budget and African Americans receiving less than 1%. Same thing with the city of Cincinnati, same thing with the state of Ohio. I mean, all of these numbers mimic each other. To not acknowledge uh, and look at these things as a hindrance to create economic opportunity for people, for African Americans in the city, in the county, in the state of Ohio, only get what we get. It will only get you what we have uh, by way of crime, uh, dysfunction, blight, uh, not caring about the community because the people who are in the communities are not in ownership of its community, are not being allowed to rebuild uh, its community. The opportunities have just been cut off. And I think that until we honestly sit down and say, let's look at our historical patterns and let's change the way that we've been doing things, I think that these barriers that have been put in front of uh, people uh, to keep them from obtaining economic opportunities are critical to where we're headed. Uh, You've seen a lot of people out in the streets, people are in Columbus today, of the unions. You will start to see more of that uh, because people are waking up and, and saying, hey, we're being left out of the opportunity to have a decent life, to provide for our children, to be able to retire, to be able to provide health care to our children, um, to be able to help our grandchildren, to be able to help family members. We don't have that economic opportunity, and I think that's the biggest um, the biggest opportunity that we're missing in Cincinnati is to really take a look at past patterns and practices and see really and truly, honestly, how to fix them because, you know, people are being left out of that.